Hello, welcome to this A-Level Music Technology lesson on mixing desks and the signal flow uh, through it. Um, it's more and more common now to not even have mixing desks in in studios or, or at your school or institute, which um, which is fine now because we can do almost everything we need to do in a computer. Well, I say almost, I'll say we can do absolutely everything we need to do inside a computer. But the uh, AS and A2 specifications for music technology still say you need to know how to use a mixing desk. I still think you should know how to use a mixing desk because even if you never get your hands on one, understanding flow through a mixing desk will help you understand flow through your DAW software and how it flows around a computer. So it's still kind of core knowledge. Um, it's quite complicated flow. It can be even on a desk that's really basic like mine. Um, it can get into multiple splits of audio. So I've drawn up some signal flow diagrams and charts that I've put on the Learn Music Technology site. So they might be worth taking a look at or even bringing up now. Um, and I'm going to talk you through my desk and Although I am well aware that my desk will be slightly different to yours or desks that you can get hand on, hands on, um, it doesn't have any remarkable features that only this desk has. It doesn't have, it doesn't, it's not missing any key features that other desks has. It's really common. So whilst the terminology, some of the wordings and some of the way they label things may be a slightly different from desk to desk, any mid-range size desk will have everything this can do and uh, this will have everything most of those desks can do. Um, exception to that being digital desks. If you're working um, on a digital desk, they can be more complicated and, and harder to visualise. But the uh, again, back to spec, they are referring to analogue desks and knowing a flow through it. So as a quick tour of my desk. This is what I've got. I've got a Soundcraft Ghost. Um, 24 channel Ghost. The number of channels doesn't matter. Often I'll get people saying, um, sort of coming, you know, clients or it's been parents at, uh, at open evenings in schools going, wow, do you know, do you know what every dial on that thing does? And the answer is, well, yes. You know, it's, well, one, it's my job, but two, all of these dials, no matter how many channels you have, do the same thing as the channel next to it. All you really need to know is one channel, oh, where, where's my hand, and the center console. So this is a 24, this desk comes in 32, and you can bolt on racks of five all the way up. It doesn't matter if you've got 48, 96 channels, it all works the same. All you need to do is understand one channel, and I'll talk about this channel, channel 16, and the center console, which is the, the bit that controls um, the other elements, I suppose, speakers, general volumes, effects, and things. So, signal will come into this, I should say, actually, this is what we call an inline desk, which is to say every channel, channel 16, you can imagine it as being kind of two individual channels in line with each other. One with lots of controls and features that we call mix A in this desk. And um, sometimes I've just seen it as mix, as main mix in other desks and... Um, Sometimes it's known as the long channel and the sh kind of a short channel, a channel with not many features, which is called Mix B here and Mix B on Mackie desks and um, Mix B in almost everywhere I've, I've seen thinking about it. Um, so bear that in mind, this one channel, this one channel actually contains two different distinct flows and that's for when we're recording we can have the record signal coming in on one of them and then the monitor path what we're listening to coming back out of the other one but keeping them both so this is just the let's say the kick drum channel it records down the long side and comes back down the short side for us to listen to or 
the way I prefer to work. We uh, record down the short side and listen down the long side. Um, right. So, bearing in mind those two individual challenges, we actually have two inputs onto this. We have the mic gain. This is a preamp. Um, not a lot to say about that. How loud is your microphone signal into the desk? And then the tape trim, which is the signal back from the computer. There's a little notch in mine. You keep this at unity. Unless there's a problem, you keep this in the middle, zero or unity. Um, and this is, in default, the volume input into the short side, into mix B, where the desk is expecting you to listen to. And this is the volume input into the long side, the mic input. However, we can switch those over with a reverse button rev in this case. Um, and if I do that, the microphone goes down the short side, the B, and the tape trim goes down the long side. And when I'm mixing, I will do that with all of my channels. I think you can see they've already all pushed down because that's the way I personally like to work with the long side on the mix side and the short side on the record side. Um, this reverse button I have seen called flip in numerous cases. Again, Mackie, it will say flip or um, Behringer copy Mackie, really, when it comes to the wordings. We also have other preamp style buttons. We have a high pass filter, it just cuts out the, the real bass input. A phase reverse button uh, for really important to use when you're recording under snare and the and the undersize of drums, and a line if we're recording a line input rather than a mic input, um, which I find I never use. But if we do use a line input, that's the button. Next, after we've set our input volume, we will go through our EQ. The EQ in this desk and in many desks is divided up into two parts. We have a shelf, which is a fixed band shelf. It's written on there at 12 kilohertz. We have just a boost. We don't have any cue controls. We just have boost or cut. Uh, and a 60 hertz boost and cut low frequency shelf. Um, do see my video on EQs if this terminology isn't making sense. And we have a button here that, if pressed, allows us to move these shelves onto mix B, which I'll say is the short side. Um, it can't do both, so it's, it's mix A or it's mix B. Then we have two bands of fully parametric EQ and an EQ on button. Not all desks have an EQ on button, so watch out. If yours doesn't, you need to make sure your gains are at zero, otherwise you will be accidentally EQing your sound. Um, so, fully parametric EQs, two bands of it. We have gain, choosing our frequency, what we want to boost or cut, and then Q, which is the width of the boost and cut. And we have two bands. One is nominally a low MF, LMF, low mid frequency, and HMF, high mid frequency. After that, we have our auxiliary controls. And this is where maybe being in a desk can be a bit of an illusion. In real terms, by default, if none of these buttons are pressed, the auxiliaries actually come after the fader in the flow. You set your volume first. Um, but on a desk, it's presented just after the EQs. Um, and that makes sense if you see this button, which is pre. I'm pressing this button, and your desk will have the option to make, make at least one or two auxiliaries pre-fader. That's what the pre button does. And that puts aux one or two in the position you ex kind of expect it to be which means it splits away from the desk goes down out of the auxiliary master control to whatever you use it before it runs through the main fader of the desk this is important this is because this is the most common way of doing headphones um, on your desks you will use auxiliaries one or two to send a a signal to your headphone or a headphone control. In fact, you can see I pressed the aux one and two button on that headphone control, set my headphone level. And that means that when my artist is in the other room recording, I can screw around with the volumes and the pans and the solos 
without them hearing what I'm doing. It's just a set level. Uh, so by pre-fader, the audio comes from here we go. They would hear the EQ, but they don't hear what I'm doing down here. Uh, unless that's lifted, of course, in which case it's post-fader, and then they do hear these controls come out of the other auxiliaries. So this desk has one, two, three, four mono auxiliaries. No, it's got six, because I press this button, and three and four become five and six. So I can't, I can use four at a time. I can put these ones on mix B as well, so they can send from mix B. Uh, I can't send the pre-faders from mix B, note. That's one of the reasons I prefer to have my mix on the long side. And then I have two stereo auxiliaries as well. Uh, now, the stereo auxiliaries will follow the pan setting. No, nope, this pan setting. Um, from the main channel. Uh, and auxiliaries, if you don't understand what they do, all they do is send the signal through a little master section that we can ignore because it's all the way up. It's permanently turned all the way up. Um, out of, you know, spare sockets at the back. Where have I got any? There's there's one or two not plugged in. There's something plugged into auxiliary five. I don't know if I can get it to focus. Um, there we go. And so that's all they do. They just sort of send it out of a spare port that I can plug into anything, uh, effects and headphones and things like that. I don't actually use them too often anymore because, you know, effects are just a bit better on computers. Um, or more convenient on computers, I should say. Then we have here, let's get it to focus. I screwed the focus up by doing that earlier. Then. Uh, a mix B volume. This is exactly the same as our main fader, but for mix B. On bigger desks, you may even see a small fader here instead of a instead of a knob and a pan to set our mix B. So again, in default, the mix B is what comes back from the computer. The way I like to run it, it will be the volume we're recording at. Um, and we have the ability to select our source, whether we wanna take the tape input or whatever the channel is listening to. That's important to know. Um, and you'll see source buttons on. I've seen them on other desks. Yeah, Mac is bearing is all set, laid out the same. Um, that if you have it set to channel and then up here reverse, that is actually just doubling up. That is also taped. So um, generally, I'll keep that up to whatever tape input it's got. Right. Um, and cut is my mute button. This desk uses the word cut instead of mute and PFL instead of solo. PFL stands for pre-fader listen. And whenever you see it written down, it doesn't, it's not quite the same as solo, I should say. Um, I've got PFLs all over the place, there's one. Um, whatever you press that button for, you start to listen to that point on the chain. So it doesn't matter what you've got here, doesn't matter what you've got here or over here. By pressing PFL, pre-fader listening, you're listening to that pre-fader moment there. Um, so it's just kind of like a solo. <laughs> After all that, it's a solo. Um, then we have our Mix A main volume control on the long fader uh, and a pan. So I'm missing because I'm actually looking at the phone screen as I record this rather than the desk. Um, I cut again just a different word for mute. I have a peak light, which I don't ever want to see flashing, a signal light, which I do want to see flashing, and uh, a solo button. And um, talk about why that's different to B-Fader. Maybe I will, but it's a solo button. Under that, I have a series of buttons that are part of what may be a routing matrix or just the routing buttons, where I choose where to send the level the signal from this channel with all buttons up we're not going to hear anything it's gonna this is the end of the road of the signal it's not going to ever make it to the speakers um however i have l and r which is the main left and right fader you may just see that called main rather, rather than l and r uh, or you may see that called mix a uh one and two which are these two I mean, these are buses right Three and four, which goes here, or groups. These groups allow me to send, for instance, I'll press, all, I'll press one and two on all the drums and then have a drum fader here. Or three and four on all the guitars. Um, 
At this point, we then would need to send it to L and R there. So you end up just having a uh, kind of a bit of a a control for groups of channels. Uh, in its most basic functionality, we just want it to send straight to left and right, which is our main black fader. Uh, I say black, it's nearly always a different colour to uh, to whatever other faders. It's got to stand out, so it's nearly always a different colour. At this point, this is the mix A level. And it's important to note that we all have a separate, and you will find a separate control room level. They are different things. Control room level is the actual volume of my speakers in the room, whereas this is the volume of the mix. Often they may be the equal the same thing, but they're not quite, because up here I can choose what I want to listen to. So mix A, we've talked about being the long side of the blackbird. Mix B, that is... Um, all the volumes coming off these little dials. I can listen to them both at the same time, mix A and big B. And these are two track inputs. Um, I don't think we should worry about them, but they're different inputs on the desk. And I have a mix B master up here. That is just the mix B version of, of that. So once we've chosen what we want our to send out to the control room speakers, mix A, at that point we have our control room level alternate alternate speaker send i have two sets of speakers so my alternates go to the yamahas they're my main set um and a mono check which will mono sum all of the stereo pans down the middle to make sure we have good mono compatibility um there are other things these in your main center console you'll have fx returns which we're unlikely to touch on a level music but maybe um again these are just kind of mini channels you just have a level and a balance and a, and a little routing matrix where to send it mix one two three four these are all the groups for four fx returns um we should expect to you know send off to a reverb on the auxiliary then plug that into a reverb and then you return it down on fx return and sell its level um just mini channels without eqs without auxiliaries themselves uh, we have headphone controls up here um, I have two headphone controls where I can choose whether the headphones listen to what I'm listening to control room mix B we've discussed so that'll be listening to whatever's on the mix B fader so I could create an entire headphone mix on mix B's or auxiliary one and two which I think I discussed earlier the level we've got set there and i have two different things i've got these going to different amps so i can have two different mixes let's not worry about oscillator and talk back the most important button really the two studio button i can talk into that microphone and uh communicate with my artists wearing headphones these are auxiliary masters levels i just set them to 10 and forget they exist and stereo auxiliary zones and i think i've talked about everything there is SIP button, solo in place, SIP. Um, with that button pressed, the solo button works and pays attention to the pan and volume of the track. With that button not pressed, solo in pre place, um, the solo will set to, no matter where it's panned or leveled, when you press solo, it will jump to zero and center. Um, I prefer solo in place, but there are many good reasons to record. And that little light is the solo light. One of the most useful things on the desk, I'm pressing solo on a channel and it will light up if a solo button, which are obvious because they've got lights on, but if you press a pre-fader button, that one for instance, that lights up. And if you're sat there and thinking, oh, I've got no sound, why haven't I got any sound? That light will tell you that somewhere on the desk, a solo is pressed and you can take your time to find the right one and turn it off. Um, so that was a very quick tour, I think it was quick anyway, of my mixing desk. Hopefully you followed the signal flow through the desk. Um, I might do other videos for with more detail as to how I use the long side and the short side in recording and mixing, because I appreciate that can be complicated to understand. But at the most basic level, understanding there are two channels in every one channel on an inline desk. Most desks are inline. Um, 
you have to mix mix B separately all the way to the control room level and mix A separate. Uh, it's just that mix A has more features. In this case, it has more auxiliaries, it has more inserts that I didn't talk about, and it has the parametric EQ controls. Okay, thanks for watching. I hope that was useful for you.